Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Conversations at Art Basel Miami Beach. Uh, I'm Ed Winkleman, and our topic this afternoon is perhaps the most complicated one we're trying to tackle in the Conversations program. Um, the question of globalism, art market, in an increasingly nationalistic world. Uh, we have assembled an amazing panel of expert point of views, and we're very fortunate to have Jane Morris, the editor-at-large at the Art Newspaper and Culture Shock, help us navigate all this. So would you please join me in giving them all a very warm welcome. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Ed, and thank you for delaying your lunch. Uh, it's a very nice of you to be here. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panel. Um, sitting next to me is Daniel Rosler. He's the director of Nara Rosler Gallery. It's based in Sao Paulo and Rio, and in 2016, you opened in New York. You represent a mixture of Latin American and international artists, including Vic Muniz and Isaac Julian. And um, very Great to have you with us. Sitting Thank next you. to him is um, Magali Ariola. She's the new director of the Tamayo Museum in Mexico City. She's also the curator of the New Meridian section here at Art Basel Miami Beach. A bit like Daniel, you've worked uh, inside your home country and outside because for quite a while you were the visiting curator at the CCA Wattis in San Francisco. And I understand that one of your stated aims at the Tamayo Museum is to increase the international programming. Okay. Next to her is Maureen Bray. She's the executive director of the Art Dealers Association of America, which I'm sure many of you is familiar with. That represents 180 galleries in the US. She was formerly a director of David Novelin Gallery and Sean Kelly Gallery. And the ADA takes a sort of major role, doesn't it, in lobbying government and policymakers and lawmakers on behalf of the art trade. And finally, to my far left, not dropping my cards, is um, Mike Dorning. Um, he's currently covering rural red America politics and agriculture for Bloomberg. He was um, deputy White House editor for Bloomberg for two years, the first two years of the Trump administration. And before that, you covered the Obama campaign and administration. So he really is a kind of expert in policy, politics, and economics. So... This is welcome our panel. So I'm going to take us back 30 years. Um, it's 30 years since Fra Francis Fukuyama made the famous uh, speech, or infamous speech, depending on your point of view, which uh, became known as the sort of end of history speech. Um, very simply, he argued that with the end of fascism and with the fall of the Berlin Wall, which came later that year, um, you know, which was the, he predicted the end of communism, that basically we were looking at the triumph of a sort of international liberal capitalist democracy. Now, to be fair, that was greeted with some skepticism at the time, but now I think we would have to look at that and say that that prediction is, well, at the very least, questionable. <laughs> um, we've seen the rise of nationalist governments, populist governments, on the left and right. It's a very debated term, what is nationalism, what is populism. But I think it's widely believed that a number of countries, obviously the United States, but also India, Russia, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, China, Brazil, Mexico, have governments that are to some extent, more or less extent, nationalist. And we've also seen the rise of nationalist parties in countries where it was really expected never to happen. And I'm thinking in that my own country, the UK, uh, countries like Sweden and the Netherlands and even Germany, where we didn't expect to see the growth of strong nationalist parties. But of course, that has happened in the last few years. And I suppose, I suppose my first question to the panel really, and particularly Mike, is, well, I mean, what do we mean by nationalism? It is a very debated term. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, it, it means a lot of different things to different people, but well, ma mainly I'm thinking about the Trump administration, Brexit, Hong Kong, things that affect big international financial markets. And I tend to think of nationalism in terms of two respects. Uh, one is sort of economic nationalism, and the other is kind of a populist um, blood and soil nationalism. And I think they're both 
things are going on in the world, both probably driven by the same or similar underlying factors, which was this kind of triumph of capitalist internationalism, with, which brought more global competition and more influx of cultural challenges to people, whether it's more immigrants into the United States or um, the proverbial Polish plumbers coming in to Britain. And in, in America, you can see it in this debate over the trade war and tariffs and protectionism, which uh, has really been a big thing driving the financial markets every day. It's been a big push in the Trump administration after, once the first year was done um, since then. And it's something that we're writing about and is sh shaping decisions all over the business world in America, including the art world. Whereas there's a separate um, populism that we see in the US, and we see that mainly in the immigration debate, but also in other respects. I don't want to dominate. I'm, I know that this is something that's going around uh, elsewhere in the world as well. I think it would be fair to say that the artists, the art world, museums, and I would also include things like the press and universities, um, are generally antithetical to, to this, this, this kind of nationalist rhetoric. I just wondered what the others felt on the panel. I mean, how do you feel the art world is, is taking what's happening in the political world around us? Maureen. Well, much to what Mike was saying, you know, we've seen an increase in the global reach of the arts community, certainly on, from the gallery perspective. That's the perspective I could speak to. We're a much more global environment than we used to be, which has been a good thing. It's been good for the artists, it's been good for the galleries, it's been good for the arts ecology. But I think now what we're dealing with is uh, a current administration, at least in the US, that uses tariff enactment as a hard negotiating strategy. And so these galleries that have these global reaches, even the smaller galleries, now have to absorb and adapt the impact of, of that negotiating strategy, specifically through the tariffs. And I, and I think that I, my hope is that the gallery world and the artists that they support will continue to grow and evolve and thrive in spite of that. Yeah. Magali, I mean, obviously you've got a very interesting situation in Mexico. You have a left-wing government that I believe is fully committed to indigenous rights, but there is some concern that it might see um, the art world, the museum world, as an example of an elite colonial culture. And equally, you're right next to, you will literally <laughs> have the border with the US and this very dominant and you know, challenging situation in the US. And I, I wondered h how that feels to somebody who's based in Mexico. I think it, like the, the situation in Mexico is quite uh, complex in the sense that it has evolved, you know, like over time and it's really, like I work in a museum that is uh, devoted to uh, international contemporary art and that's pretty much where my background is. Like I was working before that in uh, at Humex, which is also, uh, that was probably one of the first um, like international collections to, to become public in Mexico. And it really, it really made an impact, you know, like in the whole uh, way the, the local scene was being constructed. So you also have to take into account, you know, like what are the expectations, like the local expectations and the expectations abroad. So of course, you know, like, there used to be a time where uh, talking about globalization, you know, like like the the Mexican art scene was very much um, like locally ingrained at some point, but of course you need also to open up to to and this uh, and we weren't even talking about you know like nationalism at that time. We we're talking about globalization. So as soon as the the scene opened up. It was really interesting how, to see how you know, like people coming from abroad were actually expecting you to show uh, local artists. So it's, it, it becomes like very contradictory yeah, in a yeah. way. I mean, there's often this tension between the local and the uh, the local and the global, and we almost certainly will talk about that a bit more. But I mean, it, are you feeling that there is any pressure with inside Mexico for you to be more Mexican, or? No, not really. I wouldn't say so, or not yet. Not you yet. know, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 we're not we're not getting there yet. Uh, but again, I like the museum I work uh, 
uh, that I direct is uh, like it really its mission has always been since its uh, origin to, to promote international contemporary art. And that was really, again, because there wasn't like uh, that many, you know, like opportunities or options to, to show international art. And of course, you know, like it's important for the local artists also to be, and that's, that's something that, that was like really, you know, like a, like a big kind of demand at some point, you know, like if you, not everyone has the opportunity to come to Miami or not everyone has the opportunity to go to Brazil or London to, to see um, artists from abroad. So it's also like important to, you know, like be able to display those kind of uh, yeah. works in locally to, to, en to enable a dialogue to happen. Daniel, um, I spoke to many uh, curators who were based in Brazil when uh, Bolsonaro was elected, and there was very widespread alarm. Um, I just wondered how you reacted to his his uh, uh, his rise to power. Uh, for the coach, obviously, obviously, we should say he's a he's a right wing uh, he's a right wing politician who uh, has made many remarks on uh, things like uh, gay rights and so forth that many of us find problematic. Yeah, he became basically uh, known nationally by giving outrageous remarks about uh, uh, gender and uh, very conservative uh, base. And culture has been uh, a focus of attention in a very negative way uh, on the government. But uh, having said that, uh, there has been also an amazing um, gathering uh, of the cultural community in Brazil to address this, uh, these kinds of situations, right? And, and we've seen, um, on the one hand, uh, fragile institutions that have been suffering a lot with uh, fun funding that's been cut um, and really attention from the government and from the uh, uh, the, the relevant institutions that would be taking care of culture uh, lacking this, uh, this attention. But on the other hand, uh, a group of institutions that have uh, been learning for many years already how to operate uh, in an environment that can be much more independent from the swings of government. And I think that's a, you know, a very healthy um, a very healthy thing that uh, that's turning this whole uh, infrastructure into a stronger uh, infrastructure. So um, the last time I was in São Paulo, for instance, uh, I, it was very impressive to see uh, around the Paulista Avenue, which is you know a, a big axis of uh, of not only culture but also uh, business in São Paulo, a very very lively audience uh, around cultural events. So we, we have uh, new uh, institutions opening up, like the Instituto Moreira Salles, like the, a new SESC uh, in Sao Paulo. We have the, the State Museum, the Pinacoteca, announcing uh, the building of a new uh, building. Um, and is that, is that funded by with, with public money or privately? So partly. Partly because in, in Brazil the, uh, there has been uh, a law that is the basic source of funding for cultural investments called the Juan A. Law that uh, provided a separation from the government. So there is a tax break for culture, but the investments or the, uh, the decisions on uh, where this money goes is made by private institutions and, and so and and so far there has been no attack on that from government i mean there was some fear there that there been, might be and that they yeah there has been a lot of uh talking about that um and a lot of tension about what could uh, change on the uh, how the lehuan is uh, is done but uh, in reality there has been uh, i mean there, there has been a change that basically uh basically made an impact on um, musical, uh, like Broadway style uh, right. shows that had their, their funding cut. But for the visual arts, uh, it's basically maintained. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is a sense, isn't there, Mike, that, and in fact, all of us across the panel, there's, there's a sense that although we're concerned, the art world is not particularly, specifically 
in the firing line of these governments. It's more that things are happening perhaps by accident. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about what's been going yeah, on I, in the China-US trade war. Uh, well, I was going to say, oh, on, the, on the cultural side, I think that this administration very deliberately isn't targeting the um, sort of elite visual arts as much as even in the past there's been controversies about NEA funding of uh, Robert Maplethorpe and other people's um, artwork that have sort of taken a populist stand against elite art. And even though this administration, they have engaged on some of these cultural issues, they've actually done it in a way that's much more effective for themselves, in my view, <clears throat> than if they were um, you know, complaining about some exhibit at the Whitney or something. Th their focus has been on football players not um, standing for the um, national anthem at football games. And that is something that I think is much more politically effective because a lot of people in America watch football games on Sundays. Not so many go to the Whitney or MoMA or whatever. Um, and this is something that particularly for the president's base of um, you know white um, non-college educated voters and to some extent white college educated voters um, that they see every Sunday and that you can be much more relevant and, and put and, and, and boil it down to a tweet or a comment and really rev people up. So in that respect, I, I don't think that this administration from what we've seen so far has been targeting the art world in a negative sense as much. From Stephen Mnuchin, the uh, Treasury Secretary, who's a good friend of Trump's and was, in fact, a big fundraiser for Trump is very well connected in the art world through his family. Um, but the tariffs on art, in my opinion, um, were really just part of the overall game. Um, when they're going after China in the trade war, they're trying to make numbers to put pressure on the Chinese. The trade war with China is really driven by, on the tech side and to some extent manufacturing industries, being upset with what they believe to be unfair treatment in China and the vulnerability of farmers, the agrarian um, America, which is a very important part of Trump's base and trying to protect them. So the Chinese have targeted rural America in response to the Trump administration trying to help um, technological businesses of the future and to some extent manufacturing. So they just need to make numbers. They're trying not to interfere with people's Christmas shopping and you know middle class people buying children's clothes. So once you've taken all that stuff off the table, you have to make your numbers. And a good way to make the numbers is just to collect a bunch of things, including art. And in fact, Maureen was telling me a little bit about the back and forth and how they're able to get it delayed, which I think really fits into this broad um, approach. I think you're right, Mike. I, th I mean, I think at the end of the day, the the uh, art world has become collateral damage, specifically in the trade war with China, but also in the current tariff enactment against the EU that had nothing to do with the art world. It had to do with airline subsidies and the battle between Airbus and Boeing. Um, so, so then what happens is that in a case like the China tariffs, uh, last year actually could shall we just spell out what the tariffs are so sure. we've, we've got two we've got two sets of tariffs going on uh china has uh, has made has added tariffs to american art going into uh, china which led to the closure of the pace gallery in beijing or one of the reasons the pace gallery in beijing closed and now there are also tariffs on Chinese art. Is, is it just Chinese art that's over 100 years, or is it contemporary art as well no, coming into the US? It's contemporary art as well. as well. So any work that was produced in China that you are trying to import into the US now is, um, has a 15% tariff enactment on it. And that the subheadings, the way the United States Trade Representative Office works is that they give number assignments to all the different products that have ever been made. And so when you get down to the products that deal with art, the ones that have been captured in the tariff list for the China trade war is the US-China trade war, are paintings, engravings, pastels, drawings, original sculpture. 
they're very kind of vague, where some of the products, some of the other products that are listed around manufacturing are very specific. It's widget number 10, and it's made between 1980 and 82, whatever that might be. Brass ball bearings <laughs> exactly. or chilled pork. <laughs> it's much more broad in the art world, as, and so as a result, everything gets captured under that umbrella. They started that in 2018. Several of us, including the ADA, fought to get those things, those subheadings, off the list, the trade list, the tariff list, sorry. That was successful. And then as a result of that trade war heating up again and those negotiations, they were put back on the list. And in September, then the tariffs were enacted at a rate of 15%. And so now galleries like Daniel's that have a space in New York, if they were to import work from China, anything, anywhere in the world they import it from, but it was produced in China, it now has this 15% tariff rate attached to it. Wasn't Brazil like that also? I was going to comment on that because uh, interestingly, uh, we're originally from Brazil. Uh, we have, the gallery has been founded uh, some 30 years ago uh, by my mother in Brazil. And in Brazil, it's very close. And there's tariffs coming in from art from everywhere. So, and it's much higher than the 15%. So, uh, we, uh, we went to, to New York and we opened the space there in, and basically to be in a, in, a, in a type of market that would allow for a much more f uh, freer flow of, uh, of culture. And, uh, but we are very used to this environment where things are different. And uh, interestingly, this uh, creates different contexts. So if that's the way that the world is coming, uh, we're going to see much more of this, but also the, you, you, you're, you're going to see artists responding to that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very uh, known movement that happened you know, long ago when the markets were much more closed because of dictatorships and things that artists were working uh, specifically dealing with uh, the uh, distribution of art through mail art or through... Uh, so technology was going to play a role on the way that, uh, that things might evolve. And um, we're going to see uh, things changing on, in response of these uh, new environments that are happening. But it is worth saying that one of the reasons the American market is so big is because it didn't have lots of tariffs on imports. And, and the Brazilian market has, although Brazil does have a market and in many ways it's been protected, it's also been kept small. As, 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 a, as a result, so yeah. Magali, the, the other issue I'm very interested in that's connected to this is there's obviously an issue around the movement of people. Is it more difficult for Mexican curators and artists to move in and out of the US now, or is that, have, you, have you not really been affected? I think it's hard for everyone, no? Yeah, difficult for They're everyone. They're just like making it hard for everyone. So, and I don't think, no, it's interesting because I don't think that that many people are actually willing to move out from Mexico. That's, that's something that really amazes me. Maybe because I've, you know, like, I've been like going in and out so many times. But like, really, people are, are um, not in a bad way, but like very much ingrained again into the context. And, and really, there's like a very like a, a great closeness to the context. That doesn't mean that they have like a nationali uh, nationalistic agenda or anything like that. But like many, again, many of the galleries are not only supporting, you know, like the local context and the local artists, but also like trying to bring in more international uh, programs, uh, like Gaga, for example. And same, I, I think same with um, like different institutions, you know, like museums. You can totally tell, you know, like of course depends on like many, 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 you know, like things, not only budgets, uh, you know, like budget cuts or that kind of thing. But again, really, I think what we've been looking for for many years is like to open up the dialogue. And that doesn't mean that you're not, you know, like uh, interested in the local context, but it's more about, you know, like having the opportunity or create your own opportunity of uh, just enlarging the, the discussion. No? 
I would say we are very worried in the UK, to be honest. I mean, we have leading, um, uh, obviously because of the, the question of how the European settlement is going to end up. I mean, we are very concerned that it's always been difficult for artists, uh, not, not perhaps so much visual artists, but, 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 you know, dancers, actors, people like that. It's always been difficult for people outside the EU to come and perform in, in the UK um, and to, to get work permits, particularly if they earn less than £30,000, which obviously some creative people, particularly younger ones, do. Um, you know, we've always thought it was important to have that kind of flow that we had from Europe, and now we're not sure if that's going to happen. And, I mean, there must be a concern that we are building these kind of insulated fortresses of our own cultures. Well, sorry. Right, I'm yeah. just going to say, I think in culture, in finance, in business, that's always been one of the things that helps make London and New York great centers of commerce and has really built them up is there's minimal impediments um, to people coming in. And that's the way you can attract um, this very vibrant cultural scene in New York and in Miami too is another like regional cultural center that really ta takes a lot from other countries and makes it something better than every, it's sort of the synthesis is better than all the pieces. Um, certainly commerce and, and art here. Um, and that is a, a threat, but in, in some ways it, it would probably make London and New York and Miami less powerful vis-a-vis -vis other regional centers, in my view, in the long run. Can I ask about China? Because obviously we've talked a little bit about Trump. We all saw China as a very, I think, important place. It was certainly, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was opening up at a great rate, and we saw the enormous development of the Chinese art market. But now China is beginning to look like a much more difficult place, I would say. I mean, it's looking more difficult because of what's happening inside China. I'm talking about things like the Uyghur persecution, and artists like Ai Weiwei uh, questioning whether we should be doing business in, in China or whether museums should be opening in China. Maureen, I just wondered, what's, what's the ADA's uh, advice to galleries who might be interested in working in China at the moment? Well, I'd say that um, the advice generally to a gallery, any gallery, thinking about um, expanding their operation or their physical footprint or spending more time in another country to expand their market is really a highly personal one. And I, I think it's not so much advice around China, but the idea that one, if one decides that one wants to grow their business in another country, to do that research first and to make sure it makes sense does it make sense for their program, for their artists, for their client base? Those are really highly personal decisions that aren't solely political in nature. I mean, I think they have to spend, and Daniel can speak to this probably more, because you made the decision to come to New York. It's very much about, does it work for our programs? Does it work for our artists? Does it work for us as a business? And that takes a lot of time to think and to consider. One doesn't make that leap lightly, for sure. Have you ever considered opening in China, Daniel? No. No? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> we have been going to the fair in Hong Kong for seven years now. Um, and uh, we feel like this is a, a good way to, be, to have a presence in Asia. So uh, not only about China, it's, there's no doubt that uh, Asia is a, you know, a bigger and bigger part of the economy now. And uh, things, there is a, there's an opportunity in Asia for uh, the building of collections and so in a certain extent the uh, writings of uh, art history under other perspectives and uh, we felt uh, we should you know try to be part of this conversation there but uh, we we had no intention of setting a, a permanent presence uh, in Asia so uh, for us, uh, our, our, our big uh, step has been coming uh, into New York. Um, and, and was the idea of going to New York, was that, was that that you were, you were looking to sell Brazil, promote Brazilian artists to the American audience? Because I think you said that a, a large sort of base of your market is still Brazilian collectors. 
It is. We still see ourselves as a as a gallery that uh, is more and more international, but uh, sees uh, has a Brazilian perspective, and are very much involved in the um, in the are interested in the canon that's been made out of uh, this particular uh, context, and we are. Uh, working hard to be able to present these uh, these ideas, these artists, and these uh, relationships in in a place like New York that can have a resonance to to a broader audience. So in the institutional framework of New York, and yeah, that's that's basically the work that we have been doing there. Magali, I remember reading something you wrote where you were saying you, we were talking about the, the relationship between North and South, and you were talking about the fact that in Latin America people were looking to make relationships, let's say South South, and I mean I mean in the sense of the uh, developing countries. And I just wondered, I mean, how are, are Mexican museums working directly with China? Are they are they keen to keep the the, the links open, or are they concerned about the potential reputational risks? No, I don't think there is like really a strong relationship with the uh, with the East at all. It's been like traditionally, like for sure, Mexico. You know, like the relationship with the U.S. has always been very strong. Back in the '90s, there used to be a time where there were like really strong relationships with the South. You know, like the whole of Latin America, and then I guess for different reasons, like obviously political reasons and economic reasons, all of that came to a stop. You no, know, like. Uh, I guess Argentina, you know, like the, the crisis, uh, Venezuela, same thing, just, just closed down. There used, to be, um, there used to be this magazine called Polyester, which was really important at the time, and that really helped to, be, to, to build bridges be, between all of us. There, I, I think back was, in the 90s... Was that between the countries of Latin America? You yes. Mean, yeah. There was like a huge, um, like a very strong community that was built. And then, for all these reasons that I've mentioned, I guess everything, not everything, but m like much of it came to a stop. And at the same time, uh, I think that's when there was like this kind of hype of Mexican art, which became like very problematic too, you know, like it was like probably a breaking point for us and for the local scene to really, you know, like get um, much more international. And that's, that's when I think the conversation really became, uh, interesting and important because, uh, again, going back to what, what I was saying before, there were like all sorts of expectations built into the, what it meant to be Mexican, what the local context mean, in, not only in artistic terms, but in political terms and geographical terms, and it's really interesting how all of that was very much based on somehow like exoticizing, you know, like the whole wave of violence that was basically starting back then and that we're still, you know, like going through like right now. So that that's what became like really problematic again. So that's when I guess, you know, like, of course that pro kind of propelled, you know, like Mexico to the international scene, but that's also when everyone just like started to, you know, like, like really try to stop that kind of nas like national or geographical take on, on whatever it meant to be Mexican and whatever Mexican art meant, was supposed to mean. So, and I, I think like an art fair, like, you know, like uh, as I was saying yesterday during the, the art conference, a fair like Art, uh, art Basel Miami really helped to like kind of, you know, like construct all of that. And of course, then came like many other fairs, you know, like in Brazil, in Colombia, when Buenos Aires, all of that. And that's, I think it's really one of those things that contributed to, to like restoring, you know, like this kind of network that was already there and that stopped for a good so, 10 years. So rather than perhaps looking outwards to Asia at the moment, it sounds more like a, yeah, the, the, the Latin American countries are trying to work out uh, kind of how they fit into the context, having had this period where their artists became incredibly fashionable and a lot of international collectors, but particularly from New York, I think, were, were very keen to buy them. Uh, you're, you're really now trying to sort of rethink, you know, what, 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 what uh, the, the role of Mexican artists is. Uh, not really. No, it's, it's really not in my agenda, you know, like I think... No, I'm just like interested in artists and art, that's it. Yeah. So it just happens, you know, like one artist happens to be Mexican and the other happens to be Brazilian or Argentinian or North American, but like, 
No, it really, I think it really bores me, you know, like to, to think in, in nationalistic, in, in terms, nationalistic terms. terms. Michael, uh, what's happening with American uh, business? Are they still keen to work with China or? Uh... Oh, very keen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's a big market. Uh, the, uh, the whole thing is about opening up the Chinese market to more American businesses. The fear is that some of the rules they have about intellectual property, um, and requirements to have joint ventures, a lot of the technology companies, but even manufacturing and especially advanced manufacturing companies, um, they really worry that their intellectual property will be bled over into the Chinese and they won't be able to protect it. Um, and they are worried about the Chinese industrial policy to give state aid, albeit through lower interest rates or other means to what the Chinese government has determined are strategic industries like robotics, artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, 5G cell phone networks, things like that. Um, so those are the sort of issues at the crux of the trade war, plus this populist sense in America that, um, that after uh, China got permanent normal trading uh, status in 2000, they flooded the U.S. with imports, particularly for steel and aluminum and other manufactured goods, and that was a period where U.S. manufacturing employment fell by quite a bit. So all that's rolled in there, but the American companies see China as a big opportunity, and they are loath to miss that. You see that with some of the tech companies. You're talking about some of the issues people might have in the art world about the Chinese government and Uyghurs, but you can see Google, Facebook, other big tech companies very eager to get into China, but some of their staff resisting some in some measures because of the human rights uh, pressures, because of uh, other um, disputes with the Chinese government. So that's gonna be something that's very fraught. Most American companies are very much in for being a part of the world's second largest economy with perhaps the fastest growing middle class. I don't know whether India or uh, China has the faster growing middle class, but they're both very fast growing. I mean, uh, do you think that's true for the American uh, galleries, Maureen, that, um, do, do, do you think, I mean, we were talking earlier about the fact, you know, in 2006, people, let's say 2007, people were willing to take lots of risks. Are people becoming more risk averse or are people still really thinking about global expansion? Because, I mean, certainly the big galleries continue expanding apace. Well, I think global expansion can take different forms, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a bricks and mortar presence in those other countries to build a business relationship in those other countries. I mean, a smaller gallery can have presence in those other countries, but like what Daniel was saying before, by being present at an art fair in those countries, by visiting those countries to build client relationships there for their artists on behalf of their artists. So they're, they're, they might be risk adverse in the sense that they may not want to uh, outlay a lot of capital to invest in a physical location until they have a better sense of what the market is, either financial or political. Um, but I think that um, in the global market, we're very much interested in understanding what the potential is, financial and otherwise, and uh, a presence in other countries. I think that that still continues. I still, that curiosity, uh, economic curiosity, is still very strong in the art world, I think. Although it does raise questions which we've kind of been touching on a little bit, particularly, I think, on this side of uh, just uh, with uh, Daniel and Magali, is... I mean, there are questions really about how, how global the art market, the art world, ever really was. I mean, it's certainly more global than it was 30 years ago, um, but there's considerable evidence that really local markets are still very strong for, for uh, within countries. You know, it's still the case that British museums still show more, more British art than they show of anybody else, for example, and British art collectors. I don't mean the international collectors in London, but I mean the, the, the British collectors still tend to buy um, British first. I just wondered, I mean, uh, uh, have we exaggerated how much of a global art market we've actually got and art world? 
I, I think the, the, the global market is made of uh, a number of uh, local markets and uh, the and some special hubs like uh, like Mike was saying that uh, America, uh, England, London uh, were like the centers of this for the, the the facility and the less friction on on trade. But still, you would have you still have uh, tremendous bias uh, in every different market for uh, for local markets. I think that you can't. It's not very easy to to understand well uh, different contexts than what you're, uh, you know, engaging in a more daily uh, experience of your life. So, uh, and some, some of some of the artists and some of the galleries have managed to, to, uh, to overcome these isolated markets and and have a presence in multiple markets and and, and by that become global. Uh, Global artists being present in, in all of them, but I, I I do think there are very different uh, very different markets, and I think that the the this global network of art fairs have been tremendously uh, important for the uh, accessibility mm. of and and the, the cross uh, yeah that's yeah the, the the cross transactions and breeding and uh, uh, exchanging of information between these different context. We've got some time for some questions if anybody would like to quiz our panelists. Uh, the gentleman just here, please. Hi, you all. My name is London Mulbosa. Um, I'm visiting from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the founder of Art Hub. Uh, we're an e-commerce uh, art discovery marketplace for aspiring art collectors. Um, and I have a question uh, as it relates to the topic. Um, I'd like to get your opinions on how e-commerce uh, will shift um, the supply and demand uh, for global art, and what are your perspectives on how it will affect you know, the art gallery uh, and artist relationship in the next 10 to 20 years? Would anyone, would you like to start on that one, um, Daniel? I think that a lot of people are trying to understand how the digital world is going to uh, have an impact on the on the art market, uh, there's nothing very clear yet, but all indications are that there is going to be, you know, some kind of uh, uh, of shift through uh, some kind of e-commerce uh, channels, uh, or at, at least uh, digital communication, uh, the way to to access and to to give information to to these different uh, markets and contacts about what you're doing and. Uh, uh, or maybe you know some some kind of uh, joint effort between digital and, and physical, maybe through art fairs or maybe through other models that are that are coming up, but that are not so much capital intensive of us having you know physical presences in everywhere. So I don't know. Um, everybody's looking at that. Maureen, do you have anything to say about it? I mean, is it, we, we, we've been waiting, haven't we, for technology to revolutionize the art world, but it sort of hasn't. Well, and I think that's part of it is because there's this uneasy balance. You know, I think that the e-commerce, um, the growth of e the e-commerce market is important, right? Because it helps for reach um, for our artists, for the galleries. Uh, so these are valuable things. Um, but I'm also a little bit old fashioned and I'd love to hear Magali's point on this because at the end of the day, what's most meaningful for me is to stand in front of the object and to have an experience with the object. So how do we find a balance point you know, that allows the reach and growth? We want galleries and artists to be successful, but how do we also protect that very special, almost kind of intimate moment that takes place when you're standing in front of an artwork. And I think the curators and the museums are vital to us in helping protect that. No, I totally agree, and I'm as old-fashioned as you are. That's really something I would you know, like defend, definitely. And it's just probably like two different experiences, you know? Right. And it's not like one doesn't negate the other, and, but then I don't know exactly you know, like how that's gonna play into it. For sure, I know people who 
sometimes you know like sell work through Instagram, but that's also people that already have like an existing network, and they're probably selling you know like work to other people who already have seen uh, similar pieces. So that's one way of doing it. But that I was just thinking when you were talking, maybe you know like the auction system over the telephone was exactly that, no? But then again, you know that you're buying a Picasso, or you know you you normally know what you're buying. If you don't, that's when I think you really need to have like a first-hand experience and then maybe make up your mind. But that might change, I don't know. This lady at the front here and then that lady at the back. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question, especially from Magali. Despite globalization or nationalization, do you, how do you see tendencies in the art market? For example, uh, African American artists um, movement and wave or women, and do you think this is a positive thing? Do you th do you think that this has an end, or how do you see these tendencies in the world market of art? I don't know. <laughs> it's a huge question. Uh, I are we speaking specifically about the art market or in general, like institutions? I think that's, those are probably two different things, but of course they're complementary. I think there's obviously tendencies, and, but it's also like topics that are just like out there in the air. You know, like it's not only about the art world. It's like obviously, you know, I don't know, like, the, like gender issues have always been addressed, you know, like back to the, we could go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, like in very different manners, of course, like the 80s was the AIDS crisis. I guess, you know, like feminism has always been there. We're just addressing those gender issues in a very different manners in terms of the change that society has also brought up, thanks to feminism, of course, you know, like we wouldn't be where we're standing. And uh, again, I, I think it also depends a lot, you know, like from where you're standing, you know, like African Americans are African Americans in the US, as where they might be black people, you know, like in Brazil and the, the um, how say that the stakes are very different, no? Chicano art is like really important in California, but it's never been an issue in Mexico because there is no Chicanos in Mexico even though, you know, like, all these people come from Mexico. And that's, that's something that has always been, like, very, you know, like, difficult to address, you know, like, and, of course, in California, like, me being a Mexican on the top of it, blonde, on the top of it, white skin, there's, like, no way they can understand that I don't relate to Chicano art. But then no, nobody would in Mexico City again, no? So, and same thing, you know, like, feminism, I think it took, like, a long time to reach Mexico. And now it's really one of the most important, and not, not even feminism, you know, like gender issues and, you know, like and specifically talking in Mexico about feminicides, you know, like, and so that's, it's like a big loop, a very complicated one, but it's all these issues that are in the air and that just get reflected into, you know, like what artists are thinking, writers are writing, you know, like filmmakers are, you know, it's, it's really, I, I'm sure there's probably like tendencies and I'm sure there's probably, you know, like fashion, you know, like playing in, into all of that. But I th I'd like to think more about it in terms of, you know, like urgencies and, and, and you know, like issues that need to be addressed. But, but it's again, you know, like it's flowing very much also like following whatever is happening, you know, like outside of the art world or outside of the art, mar art market. Or at least that's what I'm interested in, you know, like for the rest. The lady at the back in the blue. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to build on something that Jane said. Um, she was talking about a very interesting observation about how British collectors were buying British art and uh, British museums were featuring more British art. I wonder, thinking about populism and uh, the return to nationalism, have you noticed an uptake in art about nationalist feelings at all, or the nation? Thanks. Has anybody noticed, do you, do you, mean, do you mean artists addressing nationalism as subject, or do you mean are we seeing our museums becoming more nationalist? 
artists addressing it as a subject and bringing agency of the nationalistic pride into that? Hmm. Well, I mean, I can speak. Uh, a dear personal friend of mine is an artist, an American artist based in New York named Wardell Milan. And in the last two years, um, his work is, is oftentimes about uh, gender issues. Um, it's figurative for the most part in nature. But I would say in the last year or so, the, the work has a lot more of, of a political bent than it used to. And I think in answer to your question, that's a direct reflection of what he's seeing in the world and what he's responding to. And our creatives, our writers or our artists are on the front line and they kind of guide us and ask these tough questions. And I think on our side, our job is to protect them in that process and to support them in that process. But speaking of Wardell's work, I can tell you that absolutely it has become um, much more political in the last year or two because of the current climate. I mean, I certainly think there's a growing interest amongst, I'm, I'm not saying I could just like pinpoint a finger on an artist, but. I think people are very interested in what led to things like Brexit. I mean, I think after the initial shock, I mean, I voted Remain, I think almost everyone I know in the art world, not everyone, but almost everybody voted Remain quite strongly. I think, I think there has, though, been interest since in trying to understand why other people voted the way they did. And I think this goes back, to, I think, to, to Mike's opening statement, which was talking about the fact that a lot of people feel they have been left behind, and I think there are artists who are definitely thinking about that uh, issue. I remember Bloomberg did an analysis of all the voting on Remain and, Ex and Brexit, and uh, London was very Remain, and the rest of the country was very Brexit, so if you're in the art world in London, chances are a lot of the people you knew were also Remain, but if you were like a, a farmer, you know, in uh, De Devon or something, it might be different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, two more questions. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Diana. I'm speaking. Uh, I'm a young artist, and I wanted to have your opinion on uh, globalization. And uh, I agree pretty much, and I'm very excited to be here and hear this conversation about global art and the exotification on the on the on art. Uh, I'm from Bolivia, and I personally feel that um, what you said about uh, Mexican art, for example, not feeling Mexican, but getting attracted into artists in general, uh, it's an issue because, I mean, I wanted to hear your opinion on what do you think about this, the internet and technology revolutionizing the art, and yet it celebrates all these things that go against uh, like human dignity and the the in the sense of like how like um, the objects are getting manufactured in China or in India and these places that are completely post passport and yet for example coming from well my opinion on my side I feel completely restricted as a young artist with a Bolivian passport per se in the ability to move because you get restricted into like, for example, a Chinese artist has like certain places they can go or not. And like who gets entitled to speak about certain things? Who gets entitled to get like the most intellectual out of the thing or the completely like internet and uh, the most developed and sophisticated uh, art that I guess it's very elitist in a way. So. Do you take a stance on, on that, or you just, I don't know, I want to hear your opinion on that. I think that's quite a complicated sense. question. Um, Magali? Yes, it, like very broad question, or very broad statement, rather, but uh, no, I guess, as in many things, there's good things, you know, like about like social media and whatever it implies, and there's, of course, bad things about that, no, and, and I guess, Lithium is one of those bad things that actually enable communication and you know like you being from Brazil and I just read in the papers there's they just discovered a huge uh, mine of lithium in Mexico yesterday so we'll probably get there of course you know like you know there's good things and bad things I don't think we can solve all of these 
in one go, and I don't think it's neither the artist's job to do it or the gallerist or the curator's job. It's just, you know, like I think making art is more about creating awareness and and the curator's job or the institution's job is to like follow up on that awareness and, and really like try to, to communicate that. And then I think it's like a common effort, you know, like it's not, I, it, it's not something that I can take personal responsibility for. I think it's like really like a social issue that we all need to create awareness on and then try to make our best, just as what we were speaking about before, you know, like gender issues, racial issues, uh, all of these things, you know, like. Yeah. I think there was a, yeah. yeah. Hi. I think, I think we have time for one more after okay. this and that's it. <laughs> Just a quick question about China. Um, art Basel has been at the vanguard of the globalization of the art market, but is Art Basel Hong Kong going to even be possible next year? And it, there was some mention about Pace Gallery moving out of, Be uh, out of Beijing. Have we misread the Chinese market, do you think? Well, I should say, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're all independent people. We don't represent Art Basel. I mean, as, as far as we understand, Art Basel Hong Kong is, is going ahead. Um, I suppose on the, 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 the question you're asking, I guess that's what we were sort of talking about a little bit earlier, which is there's, there's, it's a question of are we going to engage with China? Um, and equally, how are artists or are, you know, are, are we also going to challenge China? And I think that was really where I was going somewhere earlier. And I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Um, but I would imagine with the amount of activism that we're seeing across the world, and certainly in New York particularly at the moment, I find it very hard to believe that artists um, and activists won't be challenging some of the actions of institutions um, in China. But I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. I mean, Maureen, you've been seeing the protests against the Whitney uh, and so forth in New York. I think in answer to your question about misreading the Chinese market, uh, one doesn't really know, right? It depends on what one's expectations were going into that market in the first place. And course correcting those expectations, changing them or deciding that for whatever reason that wasn't the correct market for your business to be in. Um, on the political side, of course, that's a highly personal decision, and it's one that each individual business has to make, or artist, or or, um, or or museum patron has to make about what the connection is to that institution and why. Um, the, as far as the, the future of the market, though, in China, it remains to be seen. And the businesses and the artists must adapt accordingly, whether that's economic or political. That, that is um, dynamic and changing every single day. I'd just make two points as an outside observer. One, um, times of social change and social struggle, uh, particularly cultural clashes, I think in general, create like a great artistic opening and can mm -hmm. create compelling themes that in this case rise above China and around the world and to engage people to think artistically throughout the world and it's happening at the same time that there's this economic rise and China's becoming more important. And then on the demand side, one thing my employer Bloomberg does is track every single billionaire in the world and keep track of rich people. There are a lot more rich people in not only China, but other yeah. parts of Asia near there, and that can create a demand for a higher end market um, that will nurture it, whether you have outside galleries or not, I would think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about how this uh, global market and the internet is gonna make disappear the the lowest uh, degree or lowest kind of galleries we find in the market to because it's empowering the independent market right the client and the artist connection and eliminating the gallery do you think galleries are going to disappear in a couple of years decades I could say. Um, do you want me to answer that? yeah and I'll say something to you <laughs> 
Uh, no, the answer is no. I personally don't believe that's going to happen. I, I think that galleries do um, certainly connecting their, uh, their artists to their client base is a critical part of what they do, but they also support the artists in a lot of other ways. They counsel them about not just the work that's taking place in the studio, but what their presence is, how the work is placed. They help support them in uh, their presence in institutional shows. So there's a lot more than just the immediate transactional connection. So in that sense, no, I don't think so. Um, but I, I think that, and I, and I don't think that technology or an e-commerce situation would completely replace uh, a brick and mortar. Certainly, I hope not. I mean, it puts stresses and challenges on the idea of a traditional brick and mortar space. But uh, one hopes that there's enough room for all of those things because that's when the market is most vital. Oh, in fact, if anything, the evidence at the moment, this is why I said earlier about we've been waiting for this tech disruption and it hasn't happened. If anything, um, it appears to be strengthening the very top galleries and, and auction houses. The, 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 the only people who are selling at high levels are people like Gagosian and, and Sotheby's. Um, so, if anything, and, and we've talked about this before as well, the fact that globalization does actually tend to increase the power at the very top um, and in businesses as much as um, the wealthy in society. That seems to be more what we have seen, I would say. I, I think it just also, but it also gives opportunities for smaller galleries yeah. too, because when uh, trade routes open, that allows for even a smaller gallery to find opportunities in that environment. So not just the big ones, but I think that smaller galleries can, can thrive too. Mike, it's dangerous to ask people to, to, to gaze into crystal balls, but um, there's, there's a lot of different opinion about what's actually going on at the moment in the sense of, is this a temporary blip? Is this rise in nationalism a kind of temporary blip that really came out of the financial crash and soon we will be back to business as usual, the sort of classic liberal democracy that we were living in, say, 20 years ago? Or do you think there's something much sort of longer term and deep-seated going on here? I mean, is this a kind of restructuring of capitalism that we're just going to have to learn to adapt to? I think there's something longer term going on in terms of a force, but there's also a counter force that's emerging. The main thing is this uh, globalism, uh, this unfettered capitalism, uh, has allowed for more concentration in wealth. You can see that the Census Bureau comes out every year in the US and says the wealth has become more concentrated than it was ever before. And there's a natural reaction to that in society, particularly when you have this economic anxiety underneath uh, that was really brought to the fore by the financial crisis in 2008, but reflects not just cyclical trends, but broader trends things like artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, it's not just international trade, but it's changes in technology now that are uh, taking away uh, livelihoods from a lot of people. They're bringing a lot of extra value to the economy, but that's coming at the cost of a lot of people's livelihood. And there was just a report out the other day uh, by the Brookings Institution showing that that'll creep up more into the middle class and even upper middle class in the next decade or two. One counterforce in America at least, and I think in Europe as well, is that we're actually, society's changing. So this sort of cultural nationalism, I think ha has uh, a counterforce, even though the economic nationalism has all these forces that will be pushing it forward. And that is that when you look at voting in the United States, and I'm going to take a wild guess, it may be the same, it looks a little the same in Britain and in, in Europe, um, the people who are supporting Donald Trump and were supporting some of the more populist, nationalist themes were largely non-college educated white people. A lot of them, you know, whose uh, livelihoods and, and sense of culture feel like they're under threat at the moment. Well, one thing is there are fewer and fewer of them every year. In fact, um, like as a percentage of the electorate, like several percentage point drop every four years. The reason is partly because the country is becoming more diverse, and that's a change that will keep on happening. But it's also partly because 
everyone's more college educated now. People have had better opportunities to be college, to go to college, to have a broader intellectual outlook. So I think those two forces in the United States will be pressing up against each other. Um, being someone who covers economics a lot, I think economics and economic anxiety is a very, very powerful force. Um, so I think that will be probably the lead force for a while. Um, I don't know about the rest of the world, but that's what it looks like from the US. So, I mean, it looks like we've got interesting times ahead, that's for sure. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're really saying that the art world is, is being caught up in a, a much wider and uh, challenging political and economic situation. Um, having said that, we also know that artists tend to respond well to that. They tend to do exciting things with that. The art world has benefited very greatly from the free movement of people and ideas, free expression, free movement of capital as, as much as it exists. Um, and I guess we're, we're, we're keen to defend that, but um, we, we expect that the artists, if nobody else, will adapt to these changing times. On that note, I'd like to say thank you very much to my panel. Thank you very much to all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.